start over and say what you're going to say. Well, at BYU, my BYU career is really divided into two segments, before my mission and after my mission. Before my mission, I, I'm really floating. I, I mean, I don't really have a sense of what I'm going to do for a career, or what I, courses I should take. I'm just filling in general education courses. I, I'm, I'm, I go to church. I don't have a sense of any focus there until I get into Hiram Anderson's ward. And then suddenly, in the middle of my sophomore year, I decide that I'm going to really study Mormonism. And it was Hiram that inspired this, Hiram Andrus, who had been my bishop. And I, I, w I started taking every upper division course in religion that I could take that de dealt with the early history, really the early doctrine of the church. I was much less interested in church history and much more interested in theology. And that's, I think, rare, because I, I've met many people interested in church history and a lot fewer interested in, church, in uh, Mormon theology. And so I followed him around, Hiram around, and then I took course. I took courses from in the New Testament from Robert Patch, and I took an Old Testament course. I took courses in these so I could understand the background and how Mormonism is grounded in Judeo Christianity. And I did this all before my mission. And I also uh, got to know Chad Flake, who at the time was the uh, curator of the special collections of the uh, Harold Bailey Library, and he would let me in and look at journals. And I would read. I would start. I read various journals. Some of them were much more interesting than others. I think I read the Ger George Lobb journals, which contained every petty detail of the man's life. But as soon as he comes to something interesting, he doesn't say anything. I think that, I, you know, bring him, you know, milk the cow this morning, you know, you know, shovel manure this morning. You, Brigham Young came over and spoke about many wonderful doctrines. Next morning, he's up giving us a detail of what he cooked for breakfast, but he does not report what Brigham Young said. It's extremely frustrating. And it was assigned to me to read this by Hiram. I think he was doing it just to... I think he knew that there was nothing in this journal. I can't remember if it's George Lobb's journal or whose it is, but it was a. It was a. So it took me any, months to read it. Any interesting journals? Yeah, there were interesting journals. Uh, one of the things that happened, uh, but this happened later. I went on my mission. I didn't think I was going to go on a mission because we had the Vietnam War, and they had, there was a quota, and my, two missionaries had already gone to Italy from my ward, which was the Ball and Park Second Ward in California. So this is by 65? I'm talking 65 now okay. and 66. And I, 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 um, I got endowed in 65, uh, in the summer of 65. I was 20, and I wasn't going to go on a mission, but I asked my bishop if I could get my temple endowments, and the, they approved it. And so I went... And that was a strange thing. And I drove down with my roommate Jerry Hurst from we drive back in the '60s. We just drove up and down from Calif Southern California to Utah all the time. And there was not there was not a nice freeway then. It was little pieces of freeway, but mostly there was just these, you know, a double lane highway that you'd have to be shooting around into the other lane to get around trucks. And so it was a kind of a risk going down there all the time. But I made like I couldn't hundred a hundred or two hundred trips up and back to Southern California in the period between 63 and 66, because uh, we uh, maybe not that many, couldn't have been 100, but it must have been 50 or 60. And um, uh, anyway, I lost my train of thought. Oh, Jerry Hurst and I were driving down there in, in 65 for me to go get my endowments, and there was this terrific, as you, as you get out of... Uh, uh, past St. George and into that canyon that you have to drive through just before you get into the flats that lead to Las Vegas. As we hit that flat, there was a thunderstorm that I like the which I had never seen before or since, where there was lightning striking the ground all around us in just, just it, it was beyond belief. Here and there and, and in front of us and behind us and uh, and this big ball of lightning, I know that there's not supposed to be balls of lightning, but there was one, <laughs> came up out of the sky, headed right at us, and, and kind of smashed on, against the windshield. It didn't break the windshield. It didn't do any damage. But, you know, uh, Jerry was driving, and his knuckles were white, and I was, there were no seat belts. We had no seat belts. Um, 
it was kind of very dramatic. And then I wind up going that night. We got, got, we got to uh, Jerry's house at about 5 in the morning. Um, we didn't, I had barely time to shower. And his sister was getting married that day. So they were all worried about the wedding and all those preparations. So we all rush over to the Los Angeles Temple. And they had the largest session up to that date in the Los Angeles Temple. Uh, that was July 17th, 1965. And here I am uh, in this. I have no idea what to expect. There's no preparation for this. I'm sitting in there going through and getting my endowments. It took from 7 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. They all left because they, they were just getting married. They weren't going through an endowment session. So they went in, got sealed, got their, got their wedding over with, and, the, and they left me in the Los Angeles temple. And when, I, and when I got out, there was a temple worker who handed me a note that said, car parked in some place, and they left me a car, and I eventually made my way to the wedding reception. When I got there, everybody was gone. The food was gone. <laughs> So your temple experience... My temple experience was I was this huge temple session going through with a billion people. It took forever to get through it. But my experience of the temple was not negative. Uh, it was only negative in the practical sense that I was starving and that I had to get through the thing, you know, with these, all these other people. But um, I, really, I really loved the temple, and I think it was because I was not prepared for the symbology. But I was prepared for the theology because having studied all these courses and been with Hiram Andrus and others, uh, it was amazing. And um, one of the guys that I knew in this period was a guy named Guy Potter. And uh, he knew a lot about, and I learned stuff from him. And um, we were just trying to dig up information. But there wasn't much information to be had. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where the repositories were. I was. I, I knew that Hiram was digging stuff up, you know. And so it sounds like your your convictions were largely intellectual. Is that true? Oh yeah. My my whole experience of Mormonism has been one of illumination. To me, the most important f uh, way that the spirit. I felt the Spirit of God, if that's what I felt, uh, was through illumination. It wasn't... What do you mean by that? I, illumination in your mind? Yeah, illumination in the sense of seeing connections. Um, and also seeing things that I, that other people did not see. I, before my mission, I remember going down to California one time and being asked by, this, by the... Um, MIA people, if I wouldn't mind presenting, uh, you know, a presentation to the stake eminent gleaners. Well, there were about a hundred people there that showed up, and my speech was on why Christ is the Father. This was my thing. This became a thematic. This is a theological theme that has caused me more trouble in Mormonism than any other thing. Because the church advances the idea that there's, you know, from the first vision that there's the Father and the Son and, and then the Holy Ghost somewhere gets in there. But my view, which I got from Hiram Anderson, also from reading the Book of Mormon and from looking closely at the Doctrine and Covenants, my view was that Christ is the supreme being. It's very Swedenborgian. I had a very Swedenborgian concept, which I still have, of the Godhead. And that is that Christ is the Father who comes to earth as the Son. And, and then from him flows the light of Christ that we feel as the Spirit of God. There may be a personage that's the Holy Ghost. I don't have a problem with that. But, but it's Jesus Christ who is the supreme being for me. And for the church, it's the Heavenly Father. So you, you, you didn't believe back then that Jesus had a, a father? I didn't care. It makes no sense. Uh, no, I don't. So what about the first vision? Well, I, it was an angel who, it's Adam. He's the father, but he's not, and he might be the father of Jesus' body, but Jesus is the supreme being. And this Andrus, Hiram Andrus, he was teaching? Well, it's on the frontispiece of the Book of Mormon. If you read the frontispiece of the Book of Mormon, it says Jesus is the eternal God, the Father of heaven and earth. It says it throughout the whole book. 
And I bought that. I That was the theology that I, I didn't, Hiram pointed it out, but I, I could sense that from the beginning. I always was a person who believed that Jesus was yeah, the you, most important person in our theology. So you were tuning in to early Joseph Smith theology, sort of like well, New, was, New York Kirtland theology. But well, I don't and, buy that crap. And you were sort of that dismissing stuff, Nauvoo theology. I don't buy that. I don't think Nauvoo changed anything. I don't think Joseph Smith changed his view of the Godhead. I think that's just a misreading on the part of people who do not read theology, but they read history. Historians make that mistake. I don't think theologians do, because there's, he's saying stuff in Nauvoo that, if you, I, I can't quote it to you now, but there's stuff that he says uh, about Jesus when he's in Nauvoo that fortifies this view. I don't think, it, I, I think it's people maybe like, uh, I don't know who it is that has done this, but there's a theory uh, in Mormon, among Mormon intellectuals who study this that somehow there's an early and a late view. That, that I don't see that the King Follett discourse does anything. Well, come on. As God is, man, what's what? You know, as well, man that's, as God may become. You think that's talking about Jesus? Yeah, I don't see why it changes. Well, if that's true, then Jesus lived on earth and he had a God. Yeah, that's true. So there was a father. Well, no, I don't think that. I, I think that Jesus may have lived on an earth, but I don't think that... I think that Jesus is the supreme being. I think that... Well, he couldn't have lived on an earth and have always been a supreme being. Yes, he could. With a bunch of other supreme beings? Well... Was he living by himself? I mean, the, the idea that has developed in Mormonism uh, about... Well, let me first say that I don't know. Okay. But I will say that my view is that there wasn't a big uh, division in Joseph Smith's teachings. I think there was clarifications of things, but those raised other questions that were never answered. I, I don't think you can have a Newtonian view of the Godhead. I don't think it's that there's father and, you know, the son has a father and that father had a father and that father had a father. That gets us nowhere. That is just a silly uh, thing that some people said in the 19th century that made people feel better. I, I, I can't believe that that's true. Well, I mean, more importantly, you don't believe that Joseph Smith believed that was oh, true. Oh, I don't think he believed that for one minute. But you do believe <laughs> that Brigham Young did believe that was true. I don't think that Brigham Young believed it, but he taught well, The whole Adam-God theory. Well, the Adam-God theory, if understood correctly, is that Christ is the supreme being and that Adam is Michael, the archangel. And that when what Christ does is he makes a covenant with Michael, the archangel, that Michael, the archangel, will be the father of Christ's body. And, and when and Christ descends through Michael, the archangel, who is Adam, and that the Christ, the supreme being, becomes the son of his son, and the, fa and, and the son, who is Michael, becomes the father of his father. Just for a short period of time. I don't think time is a, something that you can impose on these deities. That's the, the Newtonian concept that I don't buy. What I'm saying is that, that what the Adam-God doctrine meant to do was to impress upon people that Christ was the supreme being. Because it's Christ that makes, that takes, St. Paul says Christ is little lower than the angels. He goes down through the angels. Well, this is how he does it. I mean, Brigham okay. taught a doctrine where so, he says that 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 uh, Adam is God, but 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 what he's talking about, I don't think was meant. I don't know what Brigham Young thought, but I I will say this that I don't believe Joseph Smith thought that Adam God was somehow superior to Jesus Christ, and there's a reason for this, which I would like to now explain. Okay. Because if you have the view either that the current church has, which is that there's a father and a son, or you have the view that Brigham Young had, that there's a father and the son, and the father is really Adam, God, then what you have in the crucifixion is that you have the father sending his son to die. And I just don't buy it, because that's cruel and ruthless. And you never did. And I never did buy it. And the reason why is because Abinadi says that God himself will come down. God himself will come down and take upon himself the sins of the world. Well, the original Book of Mormon also said that God and Jesus were one. Yes, they are. 
Yeah. That's my view, is that the Book of Mormon is correct. Okay. And I don't think that Joseph Smith's later clarifications on cosmogony, cosmology, and, uh, and the, the Godhead should be interpreted in a way that alters that original view. I think you have to interpret the later revelations not as junking the earlier ones, but as footnotes to it. You have to see it in terms of Jesus still being superior. I don't think he changes that view. I think he, he introduces a considerable amount of theological complexity, but he does not, I don't believe that I don't believe that God the Father sends his son to die. Because that's just cruel and... It's, you know, just, it just, it's the thing that authorizes the church to, to do away with people. And, you know, I mean, they, they don't... The church, the corporate... In other words, patriolatry, the belief, the, this overemphasis on God the Father with the idea that God the Father sends his son to die, I mean, I just don't buy that. I think that's... Um, that's not what is taught in the Book of Mormon, and I think the Book of Mormon lays out the theology that we're supposed to believe in about Jesus, and then all the other things that come later, in, 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 in Nauvoo particularly, are to be seen as illuminations of that idea and not as rejection of that idea. Okay, so, so to bring this back up just a little bit, what, what we have here is Paul Toscano in his early years as a young, you know, as a, as a, as a young man having radical theological beliefs that diverge from what's being taught by leaders and by the mainstream members of the church. So early on, you're having these divergent theological well, differences. I'm just saying what's in the Book of Mormon. No, no, no. But I, okay, I'm, I'm trying to paint the picture historically. I'm saying that early in your, early in your young men years, you had differences uh, in theology from church leaders and from the, well, the church body. So I suppose that that's true. I did not think so. Because I did not think that I was saying or believing something apart from what was church doctrine. But you probably heard people teach that as God is, man was. was well, I began. You know. This is the story I was telling. I went down to California. I was asked to speak at this Emmon and Gleaner thing, and so I put on this thing about Jesus being the Father on this theory that I just explained. Right. I didn't go into Adam God. I knew it, but I didn't go into it, and I didn't go into a lot about it. I just merely posited the idea that, you know, the Book of I quoted some scriptures from the Book of Mormon, and I said that Jesus is the eternal Father. He's the Father of the resurrection. Uh, it's in Him that we have eternal life. And I was immediately, uh, the next day, uh, interrogated by three members of the Stake High Council uh, with the theory that I might be a fundamentalist Mormon or something. But I wasn't. I was just a convert who had basically... <laughs> believed what I thought I was reading in the Book of Mormon, and which Hiram himself, Andrus, had taught at, at BYU. Okay. So this has really been my bone of contention, uh, which is the heart of the bone of, you know, this is the heart of the contention that I have, or the dissent that I have had from the leaders of the church, because I believe they, they don't believe what I think about Jesus, and they don't really buy the Nauvoo teachings either. So where are we? So, so you, had, you have always had a sincere uh, interest in theology. You take it very seriously. And when it gets dismissed or changed um, in ways that you're not comfortable with, that's important to you and you want to speak up about it. Oh, I would say that because, uh, yes, I, I would say that because I think the myth is what causes us to order our lives. We order our lives, whether we know it or not, according to the myths that we believe. And uh, it may be whether the myths are true or false, it doesn't make any difference, because we will we will we will conform to those mythological ideas. But for you, the truth of the myth is important because it it can then shape, in major ways, the way someone comports themselves and, and acts and behaves. Yeah, there's a lot at stake at the theological underpinnings for you. Yes, yes, the found the uh, I see it as the infrastructure, like the infrastructure of a building or the foundational, you know, it's like the, um, the, the blueprint. I mean, you can't really escape beyond that. And for me, and this is something that uh, in the 15, 16, 17 years ago at Sunstone, there was quite a few debates over this very issue, 
as to what was the nature of God. And, and I still think it's a mystery. I mean, in some places in our scripture, in Mormon scripture, there's the idea that God is one, and then in the lectures on faith, he's, there are two, and then there's the Trinity, and then there's the idea of the Heavenly Father and Mother, and then introduced into this is the idea of a, uh, a council of gods, uh, which is in Abraham, the book of Abraham. So what is it? Uh, but the way, the way I have read the scripture for me is that I, I don't want to lose sight of what Brigham Young said, and that is you have to keep your mind riveted on the cross of Christ. You have to not lose sight of him as the central figure. Because once you lose sight of him at the central figure, you drift into various, I think, you know, mistakes about doctrine. And, and, and the Adam-God doctrine, to me, is just the idea that Christ calls an angel to be uh, a god so that he can descend into the earth. So, real quick, are, and we won't have time to delve in each one, but were there other theological tenets that were very important to your, your belief? Or, this is putting you on the spot. but this, No, this is probably the principal one. Um, about the atonement and you know well, forgiveness the and atonement, repentance and things related immediately to Christ are very important to me. The atonement, you know, I don't agree with Boyd Packer's idea that you know we have a creditor, we can't pay him, we're going to go to hell because we can't pay the debt, and then Christ comes and he pays the debt, but he becomes our new creditor, and he's worse than the last one, according to Brother Packer. Your interpretations of Brother Packer. No, it's he. I can quote. I can quote you the speeches in which he's actually said practically what I've said. That he was a worse creditor. Well, it says that he. You know, you have to. Well, he says it. I mean, I mean, the old creditor who didn't want you to commit adultery, but the new creditor doesn't want you to have lustful thoughts. So I ask you. You know. Frankly, it's not so easy to commit actual adultery. You've got to get somebody to do it with you. But you can have lustful thoughts without anybody around. So it's easier to commit adultery in your head than it is to commit adultery in somebody's bed. And, and the fact is that uh, according to this theory of the atonement, Christ becomes a creditor. But the scripture doesn't say that. The scriptures say that once we accept, you know, through faith, we baptism, faith, repentance, and baptism in the gift of the Holy Ghost, once you accept the, the uh, vicarious work that Christ has done for you, you go from being his creation to being his child. And then you're born again. And then from being a child, you can grow up to be a friend and eventually a joint heir, a partner with Christ in the Godhead. That's what the Mormonism teaches. And, uh, you know, that the New Testament says that when he comes, we shall be like him. So I think as a theological matter, um, we can become uh, like Christ, but he's not, gonna, he's not our creditor. He, he puts at our disposal a reservoir of spirituality uh, that is his own infinite reservoir of spirituality because he makes us a joint heir. That's what it says. It doesn't say that we become uh, debtors to him as creditor, but that we become joint heirs with Christ. So where does it ever say anywhere in the scripture that Christ becomes our creditor? It's just a misunderstanding. And the reason why there's that misunderstanding, it's a, it's a works concept. People are very uncomfortable that, that, that some people sin in, the, in their youth and they take drugs and they have sex illicitly and yet they can repent and get back in on an equal footing with the person who's, who's all his life been, been faithful. Well, that's the very story of the prodigal son. And, or the story that Jesus tells about the laborers in the field and some worked all day long and got a, the same amount that some who came in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and only worked for three hours and they got the same. And the ones who had worked all day long, he says, well, I paid you what you asked for and can I not do with my own what I wish? I can pay them the same if I want. They're not, they're not you know, it's creating a union problem. You know, he's got, a, he's got laborers that are unhappy because he's being generous to one. And I think that's the issue, because when we see the mercy of God come down upon someone who we are offended by, it hurts us, because we've worked all day long. We've labored all the day long in the heat of the day, and then the Lord blesses this other person who comes in as a kind of a latecomer, a Johnny-come-lately, and he gives them the same blessing. It seems it irritates us. And I think that's at the heart of this feeling that the atonement 
needs to be a little bit needs to be explained a little more legalistically but I do not understand it that way I think Jesus is not legalistic that he loves his love is without condition and in rever you know in a kind of an image of the crucifixion his arms are stretched out to us all the day long so so Christ um, God the nature of God or Christ as God, the atonement, forgiveness, resurrection, these are the central themes. Any other ones stick out as being as being ones that were really important to you, you know, back in those early years and, and from then on? Or are those the main? Those, I think, probably are the main ones. Uh, the, what about one true church and priesthood authority and, and uh, you know, keys? Um, were those resonating with you back then? I felt that the priesthood issues were very important although I do not see them as authoritative in this I, I, I originally accepted them pretty much the way the church teaches about them but the more I studied priesthood issues the more I realized that priesthood was really um, taking upon yourself the image of Christ to become a priest after the order of the Son of God means that you um, he's the head of your order and it's, it's, it's to him that you need to dedicate yourself not somebody else and not to a corporate enterprise not to real estate it's to him what about just divine revelation and, and prophets and apostles you know as, as getting God's guidance and revelation and then giving it to the members was that ever important to you? Or well, fundamental to, to it you. didn't seem to me like it was. That was really what was intended. I, I, I never thought that. Um, the leaders of the church were dispensing the gospel. I thought the leaders of the church were dispensing the ordinances. And that once you had the ordinances, it was up to you, to receive your own revelation about the gospel not to sit at their feet and have them tell you what the gospel was. I, I, my, it, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What the keys of the priesthood did was allow the ordinances of the gospel to be administered. And once you have the ordinances, and by the, through the ordinance, it says that the, somewhere in the Doctrine and Covenants, through the ordinance, the power of God is manifest, and from the power of God you get in the mysteries. But the ordinances were a way that binds us as a family. The ordinances are merely reenactments of our incapacity to save ourselves. It takes a priest who represents Christ to bury us in the water and pull us out again, which shows that a new person is being born. And when you go to the temple, you know, that, that ordinance is done in the baptismal fonts in the temple in the lower part. Then you go through the rest of the temple ordinances, which are clothing, and which is like we put swaddling clothes on. And getting a name, which is like getting a name, and you just grow, and and you go through this maturation. That's what the ordinances of the temple represent. Symbolically, you are maturing as a child of Christ to the point where you become one with Him and, and the Godhead. Well, I didn't think that that required disp dispensing information. 